Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you all with us. Uh, Founderline's all about helping people with their startups. So you might be somebody who is thinking about starting a company and you want to get some advice before you get started. Uh, you might be someone who has already started a company and you're encountering a situation in the operations of your company and you want, want some help. Or maybe you're an employee thinking about joining a startup and you want to ask some questions uh, before you decide to uh, dive in and accept the offer. In any of those cases, we'd love to try and help you today. This is a live show, and the best ways to reach us right now are via email, uh, help at founderline.com, or you can tweet at us. Uh, to, the Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Chamath. Pali Hapatia. I practiced that, by the way. Thank you. Uh, and he's the founder and managing partner of Social Capital, uh, which is a venture capital firm based in Palo Alto. Um, Chamath was instrumental to the growth of Facebook and an investor in a bunch of great companies. Uh, and uh, close to my heart, he's also one of the owners of the world champion Golden State Warriors. Um, Chamath, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for letting me be here. I, I know you're a busy guy and I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so usually uh, I like to start off with just a few questions, get you warmed up uh, before we dive into helping uh, entrepreneurs out. So I thought we could start with the Warriors. Um, I'm a lifelong NBA fan, grew up in Chicago, so was a, was a Michael Jordan fan all those years and uh, moved out to the Bay Area and you know I, I didn't have my Bulls, so I had to adopt a new team, which was the Warriors. Um, been a season ticket holder ever since. Um, so you, you had a, a pretty interesting seat with uh, you know, a new ownership group that came in led by Joe Lacob and, uh, uh, you know, probably some really great lessons around leadership and uh, change in a franchise that was kind of stuck in the mud for a while and, and um, amazingly uh, was lucky enough to, to win a championship this year. So walk us through, uh, you know, what you learned during that process. I know you weren't, you know, necessarily there day to day, but I'm sure yeah. you... Uh, you saw some interesting changes in that time period. Yeah, it's actually a really good insight into what I do every day in many ways because it reaffirms <clears throat> the value of leadership and culture and personnel. And so, you know, when we, when Joe inherited the team, Joe and Peter Guber, um, they literally had to go top to bottom and start to figure out, you know, who was going to stay and who was going to go. And, you know, the most important thing that they probably did was. Um, hire this fantastic executive um, who worked at the NBA for a long time and the Phoenix Suns for a long time, a gentleman by the name of Rick Welts, and uh, started to build an organization around him. It's not much different to actually, you know, finding a fantastic player and like building a team around them, hmm. trying to find the complementary skill sets, trying to find people who can support the values that you have, yeah. and then promote those values broadly in an organization. So in that way, you know, I mean, I'm on the board, so I see that kind of playing out not dissimilarly to how you know I'm on the board of a startup, and it's exactly the same thing. Really? Yeah. Just a, you know, investors helping uh, basically catalyze the culture with the right sort of people in these very formative moments, and then uh, giving them room to manage and run. Interesting. That's it's you know probably no surprise given Joe's history in venture exactly. capital and with KP and, and exactly. uh, you know doing that in companies is yeah. Is and I, I think like. Four, there's six board members. I think four of us are investors. Really? Yeah, all different asset classes and stages, but yeah. So Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, bringing home the trophy. That, yeah. was, uh, that was really fun, and uh, I, I know how hard that is. So I, I got a little spoiled with six of them in Chicago uh, yeah. and just sort of watching that play out, and maybe we've got a new dynasty on our hands. So we'll see. Uh, yeah, knock we'll on see. Uh, fake wood or knock whatever this Knock on fake is. wood, exactly. Um, well, so I, I know um, I know it's been a, a tough year personally for you, um, and uh, you know, I, sitting on the sidelines, I, I've sort of seen you really um, shift into another gear in terms of uh, how you want to affect outcomes and have impact and and sort of um, bring the message of of change to to the venture capital industry and and you know beyond that the the extended ecosystem. Um, Recently, you just a couple of days ago, you published this uh, this great article um, along with information called uh, what was it, Bros Funding Bros, right? And uh, a, a great summary of 
sort of the lack of diversity in, in venture capital. So let's talk for a few minutes about, um, uh, well, why you did that, and then also, um, you know, what, uh, what came out of that uh, investigation. So it's probably, um, there's a multi-pronged answer here, which may drag on. So no, go for it. Guy, guys on Twitter can tell me to shut up. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we got out of the gate. When, when we started Social Capital four years ago, we got out of the gate really early because we had a lot of really good investments, and a lot of them started to return a lot of money. And uh, in that, what happened was I think that we started to also get a little complacent and... Um, lose a little bit of ambition of what was possible to build and instead sort of fell into this routine of saying, oh, well, we could probably just be the best venture firm in, in Silicon Valley. And that was a pretty good thing to be. And we thought that there was a path to do that. And this past year, as you said, you know, I've kind of like in these last 10 months, my dad passed away, one of my best friends passed away. And uh, it sort of even more amplified that drift because I was sort of a little disengaged, quite honestly. I was mm. really emotionally detached from this company that I had founded, mostly because of these things that were happening in my personal life. And yet, at work, things were going so well that there was really not a lot of impetus to change. Hmm. I think a lot of people probably go through some version of this at some point. Yeah. Um, and then in the last two months, I kind of just, you know, dealt with it. I mean, you know, I mean, I'll be very honest about this. I went, you know, I saw a therapist and a grief counselor and really just unpacked a lot of this stuff. And I got to the other side of it and I was like, okay. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get back into this. And I wanted to reset the firm in many ways. And so the, the, the way that I wanted to do it was I said, okay, listen, um, I want us to reframe our goals and say at the worst case, we'll be the best venture firm. But at the best case, we can really affect human outcomes. And we can use technology to really reshape a lot of these fundamental human needs in the world. And I think that's an ambition that we should aspire to. Hmm. And um, in order to do that, we need massive amounts of capital and we need to be able to take that capital and deploy it really effectively. And I said, let's marry that goal with the short-term tactic of basically becoming the best, best venture firm. And I said, go out and map all the venture firms so that we can start to figure out what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and let's copy the stuff that works. And they're like, you know, some of the guys on the team were like, well, we don't know how to start that. And I'm like, well, just go to the fucking website. Start, start with that. <laughs> Crunch base. Or, and, or, yeah. and, so, and so they did that. And so this was an exhaustive three-month effort of just going through a lot of, you know, SEC filings, going through Crunch base, going through Venture Source, going through to every single venture firm, and trying to categorize and characterize the things that they were all doing over decades. Hmm with this goal that hopefully what we would be able to extract from that was a bunch of takeaways that we could use to improve the way that we ran internally. Awesome. And we had a bunch of really interesting takeaways. The most interesting takeaway, quite honestly, was that there is a really high correlation around results and age. And that correlation is that there is literally you know, very few examples, almost, you know, 85 to 90 percent of all Series A and Series B successful outcomes have always been done by a venture capitalist under the age of, you know, about 47 or 48. Wow. And if you look at the companies that today are going to be the next major outcomes, then it pushes the lower bound of that even further into like the, the lower to mid 30s. So what that really says is that, you know, in the Series A, Series B investing game, it's really a kind of young person's gig. And I suspect it's probably because the life stage is such where they're closer to the ground of what the services would be that they use. There's more empathy around the founder situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're probably not married or just married, young kids. So there's all kinds of factors that conflate in being able to dedicate your mind. And I could see how, you know, once you're in your 50s, You've probably been somewhat successful. You have a little bit more wealth. You're also thinking about, you know, how do I want to spend the last 20 to 30 years of my life? And so you're going to make different sets of decisions. Yeah. So that was a major step, you know, for us where we said, wow, when we start to age into our, the average age of our firm is about 38. But I said, when we start to get into our mid 40s, we can't be taking up the carry. We can't clog the ranks. What we have to do is be able to assemble an extremely diverse partnership of individuals and bring them on at these young levels, support yeah. them, grow them, mentor them, and give them the bulk of the economics wow. so that they then go and do the work. And what we should do, 
because if we are lucky to be in this business in our 50s is we'll have enough wealth where we should be investing. That's how we should make the money. We should be the LP. We should not be making money as a GP, even if we are practically the GP. Interesting. So that was one major takeaway and realization about firm construction. And, and by the way, the data, which I've looked through, I mean, it's, it's This is 30 years of outcomes. Comprehensive, so right? this is, I you mean, cannot debate this. Yeah. It's 30 years of actual exits. But I, I was impressed you guys had as much data as you did. Like well, somebody was scraping the web I mean, for you know, months, right? As, as one of us said, like, you know, we're just going to go ham on this shit, yeah. you know? Yeah. And we did. And uh, I think it caught a lot of people off guard that you could just go and, you know, hand document all this information just by taking the time. Anyway, yeah. so, so that was one major outcome. All right. The second one was we looked back internally and you know, every quarter we do this thing called an expectations analysis. We ask everyone at the firm to give a low, medium, and high expectation for every single company we've invested in. And what's interesting about that exercise is that you're talking about a very diverse, eclectic group of people, meaning we have data scientists, we have engineers, we have investors, we have associates, we have partners, our CFO, our GC, a mix of people. And what you get with that is a very asymmetric amount of information. The companies where I'm on the board, I have a lot of information. Even though I'm sharing the information out with everybody else, they don't have time. Right. And other people have different senses of it. Some people may use our products, some people may not. And what's amazing now is that you know we have 18-ish, 20 people. That's enough N, right? That's enough signal where you have these really interesting data sets that occur. And we've been doing this now for four years. And when you look at all of the companies that are generating all of the returns for us, they're all the ones which these large upper bounds and lower bounds on outcomes. The error bars are huge. Really? So wherever there's disagreement, High beta. There's, there's the ability to generate massive outcomes. Wherever there's consensus, there's still a lot of value, but they tend to not surprise anybody. And typically what happens is companies spend many years in these periods of disagreement and lack of consensus around what they're really doing. And then they get un get into this breakout vo you know velocity, and all of a sudden everyone kind of says, "Oh, they anoint them," and you know whatever. And so I said, "Look, as a Series A and B investor, we need to live in that world of ambiguity. How do we do that?" Yeah. And the only way that I saw that we did that is by putting a bunch of different people together that don't necessarily think the same way and act the same way. Um, and so the result of all of this was this big study that we did with the information because we went to them and he said, hey, listen, we've been working on this. If you want to you know, look at this, what, what do you think? And they said, wow, we have to tell the story. And so um, you know, together we decided to tell the story. And so um, to be honest with you, I hope nothing changes because I feel like we're, you know, we're really doing the right things and we're running away with it. Um, <laughs> and so a lot of these venture firms are DOA. They're kind of the walking dead. And you know, the many that people think are sort of like top, I think, you know, time will tell, but I don't, I don't think that past returns are really indicative of future returns. Um, and I think that'll play out as well, yep. where, you know, firms will just either retire because of massive distributions or they'll just continue to age out. And when you put all of these two things together, you know, a, a lot of consensus lookalike decision makers and an aging cohort, that's the kiss of death in my opinion. Double whammy. Double whammy of garbage. <laughs> it's going to be garbage. Well, time. And, and historically, um, you know, you mentioned the the economic returns in some firms. The the older white gentlemen who are, you know, aging up, um, the bulk of the the returns go to them, right? And um, and so that model. You have to. I mean, this is the thing. Like there there is a you know uh, there's a, there's a really popular phrase which I love, which is it's way better to be long term greedy than short term greedy. And I think, like, you know, when you're sitting on top of a venture firm and you can take the bulk of the economics, the ability to not do so and, and rather instead invest your capital is being long-term greedy. It's about rewarding the platform and, being, and honoring the platform that allowed you to make the money in the first place. Interesting. Right? So these are very simple signals that really, you know, tell a person the, the, the character of that individual. And I think it's very clear to see who really cares about their platform and who doesn't. That's why, for example, at our firm, you know, we are the largest GPs. We will. We always have been, or the LPs. We always have been. We always will be. We are the biggest at risk. We are the most at risk. And you know, when we're we're not a multi-billion-dollar foundation. You know, we work hard for our money, but we put it all back in. And the reason we do that is we think we make better decisions. But they're also the reason we do that is that it aligns the incentives. Interesting. Well, and one of the things I'm looking at doing another company, and one of the things I've been looking at is. Um, as a founder, how do you distribute equity to the early, you know, first N employees in such a way that uh, they actually feel 
sort of a founderish level of ownership, you know, I, I could own 100% of a company and it's worth nothing. But you know, maybe there are ways to distribute it in a in a in a different fashion than we've done historically. You know, give an early engineer one percent of the company and and hope for the best. Uh, and and you know, I think similar things play out in the VC world as well. So um, yeah. that's that's great. Um, well, we could, we could spend hours on this, but uh, I want to make sure we get to some of the questions that have been pouring in for you. So yeah. um, so thank you for that and. Uh, uh, once again, if you want to uh, reach out to us, you can email us, uh, help at founderline.com, or you can tweet to at founderline. So let's, um, let me switch over to the questions here. And uh, first one is uh, from Box in Toronto. So um, did you, you grew hometown. up in, uh, Toronto's your hometown? I knew it was Canada. I didn't know where it was. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, this person is a fan. Uh, what's the best way for a Canadian to connect with Silicon Valley VCs? And secondly, any tips on building your ne network once you get to the Valley? So there, there was more to the question. Um, it looked like they might be on their way here at some point. I so. mean, I, I think the venture industry in Canada is structurally broken. Um, and it's largely, again, because the 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 composition of the allocators of capital in early stage venture are wrong. Um, the biggest you know thing that you see in Canada is like these people are like ex bankers, which the VCs, which is like seems like totally idiotic to me. Which you know like I think you know I, I think maybe some bankers could be great early stage venture capitalists, but more than likely bankers are much better late stage investors or public market investors. And really, what we need are people who understand the product iteration and product creation process. Yep. And those tend to not be those people. Yep. And uh, I think uh, in the absence of having a cohort of those and a rich cohort of those, then that that industry will never take off, which is a shame, because there's a lot of extremely talented people in Toronto, in Waterloo, in Montreal, in Vancouver, in Ottawa, yeah. who are highly capable um, and could build some fantastic businesses. So that's the first thing. I think. Coming down here, there are a couple of pathways. Um, C100 is an obvious pathway. I've been a member of that since the beginning. It's a basically an organization of you know Canadian expats here in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And uh, I've actually been introduced to a bunch of different companies through different people in that organization. Um, you know, it's no different than when you're an immigrant from anywhere else. Like you're, you, you feel a lot of pride when you see somebody else from your homeland. And so, um, I think the C100 thing has a lot of value in that sense because. That'll allow you to build a network. There's a huge, actually, like, expat community here that kind of, we all are very silently under the radar, like, waiting for the, the zombie Canadian apocalypse. Mafia. We're all waiting for the zombie apocalypse to emerge, <laughs> you know, with our, with our with uh, your, maple uh, leaf. jerseys on? Yeah, with our hockey jerseys on. <laughs> start checking some people and eating some beaver tails. Yeah, Yen Lee was telling yeah. me about that uh, not too long ago. But there, there's a huge cohort of them. And so uh, I actually think once you're down here, whether it's through C100 or other things, it's actually quite easy to get plugged in. Um, Are the, the, the immigration the, issues like get, getting? No, that's actually gotten a lot better as well because they've, you know, through the North American Free Trade Agreement, we have like a fairly flexible immigration pathway now, um, and so all of that has gotten a lot better. The reality is that I actually think coming here is probably not that productive in general, um, and I think like you're actually better off on a on a on a probabilistic basis staying where you are to actually start a company. Hmm. Um, you're much better being, you know, a small fish in a large, uh, or sorry, a, a large fish in a small pond in Toronto because I think then there's a lot of people that just don't want to come to the Valley, don't want to live with the, you know, high cost of living, particularly if you're, you know, wanting to start a family and actually buy a house. And so there's very practical realities that make Silicon Valley untenable for many extremely talented people. Hmm. And so being in Toronto or Vancouver or Winnipeg or Ottawa is actually great because if you actually have a good idea and it gets any amount of, you know, escape velocity, you can attract some fantastic people because they want to be in those cities. And uh, the economics are much more rational. So build it um, there and then come to look for the money, perhaps. Yeah, and, and, and there's know, a couple of these good examples. You know, Shopify was one that started in Ottawa and stayed in Ottawa, but still has tremendous, you know, capital appreciation or capital that's come from uh, New York and Silicon Valley. So it is possible. But like I said, that will get easier once there's a broader class of venture investor in Canada that actually understands product and, and are willing to take um, true product risk and venture risk versus, you know, what I called in that op-ed product market fit risk. Got it. All right, well, uh, Box, thanks for the uh, question. Let's go to Aaron in Palo Alto. Um, how much does investor diversity affect the performance of a fund? 
Also, do you see LPs seeking out more diverse venture teams? Interesting so, question. So, so, so I think like diversity needs to be more broadly defined than how it people think, oh, well, let's just have a bunch of colored people and everything is going to work out. I don't think that's what diversity means. Diversity, if you ask me, means you have a really interesting complexion of experiences. Now, one way to solve for experiences is gender and race. But another way to solve for experiences is roles and, you know, sort of like how you grew up and, you know, those types of things. And I think both are really important because what you really want to do is create intellectual conflict. And so diversity to me is embodied when you can take a bunch of people in a room and someone has a framework and half the people have this quasi-quizzical look on their face yeah. because they can't relate. And I actually think that's really productive. Now, if you all respect each other and care for each other and like each other, then because you can't relate, you're not just going to be dismissive. You're going to try to unpack it and try to get to ground truth. And typically, in that process, I think you get to really great answers. And so um, is it correlated with returns? What I'll tell you right now is, again, when we look at you know, where our funds are trending to, I would put our numbers up against anybody. I think over the last four years, we have been running roughshod over the industry. And... I don't know many of the great decisions that are driving our outcomes that were ever made in consensus. And our partnership, even those decisions, we have, you know, at the time, the four principal partners, an Asian woman, myself, a Pakistani guy, a uh, white Jew, you know, we had every single religion represented. You know, I grew up on welfare. One guy grew up, you know, in North Dakota. You know, one, you know, our female partner grew up in Toronto. You know, one guy grew up in um, as a Pakistani Muslim in Germany. Like, they're all just a mishmash of experiences. Mm -hmm. And we all had to try to kind of get to ground truth on Slack and get to ground truth on PSYAPs or Premise or Yammer or Box. And um, we made good decisions in ambiguity where there was no consensus. And uh, I look back on it now, and I think that's what we need to capture in a bottle. And I think that's what you know, LPs, uh, limited partners, and investors in these funds should be demanding. It can manifest as a group of white guys, if that's what you want. But you got to make sure that intellectually, when they get in a room, there's this versus kumbaya -ing. Yeah. And that's the thing that I was trying to call out. This kumbaya -ing is what's is what is deadly. So I think we're at war. Think, is that what you, you're yeah, about? I mean, like, I feel like I'm at war, and I've told people this. They're like, Who "Why are you did at you?" War with? So I said, "Why? Why did you write this op-ed?" And I said, "Because I'm at war against bad ideas. I'm at I'm 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 going to war. There are all these fantastically talented engineers that should be working on the substantive ideas of our time. And the reality is, they could just as easily be convinced to work on something that some would say is, you know, nth derivative of something." And we have to fight that tendency. Hmm. Even if that nth derivative thing is easier to understand, quicker in terms of feedback, it still is not the right thing for what, broadly speaking, society needs and what we as a class of individual who control the spigot of capital should be responsible for. Hmm. We should be responsible for creating the future. Think about the guys that initially funded Fairchild to create the transistor. Yep. That's the moment we're in. We're at a fork in the road where we have to decide are we that class of individual, or are we the nth plus one version of business models that just kind of are quizzical and comical and are really about convenience for the 1% of the 1%? I'll give you a different example. Um, Elon Musk yesterday said that you know, he expects planes to be electrified. That's amazing. Now, that probably makes sense for small planes. But immediately my mind goes to, wow, how incredible would it be if we could electrify a huge plane like yeah, a Boeing? That's what I was. You know, 747. Yeah. But if you've seen a 747, you realize that we're going to need to make a massive leap in our understanding and capability of batteries to do that. Well, who's going to work on that problem? You know, or, you know, right now we have a semi-interesting understanding of the human genome, and we actually know how to edit genes, but we really don't know how that process will play out and how to really productize that. And all these people right now that could solve these problems instead are working on, you know, food delivery. They're working on, uh, you know, hedge funds. And I just think that we owe ourselves an alternative to that that can be a safe harbor for intellectual curiosity and exploration. And it has to start with us taking risk. That's great. Well, uh, Aaron, I, I hope, uh, hope that helps a little bit. Um, Let's go on to uh, a question from Australia. This is uh, Harry from Melbourne, and um, Harry wanted me to pass along. He grew up in the same 
neighborhood is Andrew Bogut, so he asked that you say hello to Andrew next time you see him. Uh, I saw Bogut on Sunday. He's he's great. So uh, I don't I don't know if he knows this guy, but H A R I. Um, his question is. Uh, how do you stay motivated to keep reaching for the stars after all of your success? Do you treat entrepreneurship like a game, or do you feel connected to entrepreneurship as a purpose? I think we got some of that answer a minute ago. but uh, Yeah, I think it's very purposeful, and it comes from a place that is in part aligned with this earlier sort of line of um, answer, which is um, in this process over like the last 10 months, the biggest thing that I probably realize is just how impermanent all of this is. Um, you know, my dad was 72. He was sick. He was diabetic. We were expecting it. Yeah. My friend Dave, we were not expecting it. But in in both of those two things, um, what I realize is, you know, okay, if if I were to die today, I feel pretty good about my life. Like I'm like, wow, that's a pretty good life. I basically have tried to do everything that I wanted to do. Um, I want to do a lot more. But I'd be like, that's pretty cool. And I'd probably see what's on the other side of all of this. Um, and so what I realized is like, you know, we're just a speck of dust in time. You Absolutely. Know? I'll live 80, 90 years. Yeah. But that's, you know, I, I'm 80 to 90 years of 9 billion people on this earth, 7 billion people on this earth's 80 to 90 years of a billion years of the earth. Right. So we're 80 over 80 times 9 billion times a billion. It's kind of approaching zero, I think. So it approaches zero. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a really good way of saying it. And so I feel just very comfortable that, you know, things are just, you know, there's an impermanence to things. We're, we're here for a little while. And so I feel like you got to just keep pushing. It's yep. like, what's the point in stopping? Well, um, and, and theoretically, you, you know, if you live to 80 or 90, you know, you're, you're not even halfway there, right? So, um, so what are you going to do with the, the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, right? Uh, I, I, so we've, so, you know, in this process of, at Social Capital, you know, we have this very clear mission, which is around using technology to disrupt and rebuild all these, you know, fundamental human needs. But we said, well, that's a very amorphous statement. And so we tried to say, well, let's put some numerical goals around these things. Um, and so the way that I think about you know, how I live out the next 40 to 50 years is by basically saying to myself, I would like to, you know, have built and invested in services that touch at least 25% of the world's population. So at the, you know, in 40 or 50 years, you're talking about two to three billion people. Hmm. That's a big number. Yeah. Two is I'd like us to be part of businesses that are employing at least 10 million. And I'll get, I'll get to that in a second why that's important. And then the third is I'd like for us and our partners to have made a trillion dollars. And all of these things seem crazy, kind of seem crazy. Um, but it just gives you a goal that's far enough away but somewhat tractable in the mind to just stay focused. And, and that middle point, by the way, of why 10 million people, I also think that part of doing this and building social capital is showing a path where we become an alternative to what otherwise is a very you know, paradoxical choice amongst young, smart people, which is a for-profit technology company and a non-profit or government. And I think there's this really interesting thing in the middle, which is you take the best parts of this, which is the ability to get paid and recognized and valued, independence and technical leadership and risk-taking, with a large, broad-based, value-oriented agenda around what needs to happen for societal progress. Hmm. And uh, I want to pioneer that model. And I want that to be a safe harbor for thousands of really smart people, millions of really smart people. Because in many ways, that's the majority or the silent minority of people that will keep this earth from imploding on itself. Yep. And I think we need that. That's awesome. I love it. So um, we're about halfway through. So I need to take a minute to thank our sponsors. So Great. sit back and relax for a second. Great. And, um, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you to our four amazing sponsors for this season of Founderline. Uh, they are Auric and Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. So let's let's start out with Auric. Uh, I've been working with uh, Mitch Zuckley and the team over there for many years on multiple companies. And uh, as you guys know, Mitch was here last week. Um, I always tell people when you're getting somebody to help you out with your legal work, of course they're going to take care of the basics, the contracts and the employment agreements and all that sort of stuff, financing docs. 
But th that's just the basics. What you really want is an advisor who can help you out when tough situations arise, when you need to make critical decisions about funding or acquisitions or whatever. And uh, Mitch is the sort of lawyer and, and people on his team are the people who have seen so many of these transactions, many, many more than you'll ever see. And uh, you want somebody in your corner who's going to be, be able to help you out through those processes. So could be, uh, you know, that advice can come from a board member or a friend. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a big believer that your lawyer can be very helpful with that as well. Uh, you can find out more about Auric on their website. Uh, the URL is auric.com. Uh, next, I want to thank uh, our sponsor, Square One Bank. Uh, again, I've been working with Sam Bomick and Lori lumenti Gardi over there for many years, and a uh, great group to work with. Uh, of course, you want your money to be safe. That's sort of table stakes for any uh, bank. But beyond that, you want them to make your life easy. So things like uh, online banking, maybe uh, company credit cards so you're not racking up a bunch of personal debt that uh, after everything's over, you know, you end up owing $30,000 because you, you didn't have a company credit card. Some very basic stuff that you can do, and uh, they, they can absolutely help you out with that. Uh, you can find out more at their website. It's squareonebank.com. Uh, next, let's uh, talk about Accretive Solutions. They're the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley, and um, business outsourcing is your entire finance function. So, um, Martini Niganol was my interim CFO at my last company. Um, she's also helping out with Founderline. And they basically, um, you know, when you're a founder and a CEO, uh, you have more important things to be doing than making sure that the payroll is getting paid correctly and the numbers are adding up and your board packages are formatted properly. Um, you, you need to outsource that to somebody who can take care of all the basic blocking and tackling and uh, make sure your numbers are correct, that you're on a good trajectory, you're not running out of cash, uh, but, but just sort of take care of all that stuff, paying the bills, um, invoices, expenses, all that sort of stuff. Um, they can do it very cost effectively, and um, uh, someday when you grow up, you can uh, you know, have an entire finance team that you can hire and, and work with, but in the early days, you know, the first year or two, um, you, you can outsource that to somebody who can work part-time on it and do a great job. Um, you can find out more at their website. It's as-bos.com. And then uh, finally, I want to thank uh, the team over at Ustream. So Brad Hunstable and uh, his team over there have been with us since the very beginning. Um, that When we told them what we wanted to do with Founderline, they said, we want to make sure you guys have the best. And uh, they've been great to work with. We're streaming this to you live right now over Ustream. If you um, have a company and you want to do some company events, or uh, maybe you're just uh, you know, somebody who wants to have your own show and put something out over the airwaves, uh, you, you can do that as well if, if you want to. Um, uh, they've been great to work with and their technology is the best. You can find out more at their website, which is ustream.tv. So um, that's paying the bills. Let's, uh, let's keep going here. Um, Got a bunch, bunch more questions to get through. Um, so this one is from Bill in San Francisco. It's uh, about messaging. So uh, it's f funny we were just talking about that. Um, messaging seems to be a very active space right now with Snapchat, WhatsApp, WeChat, Slack, etc. Um, you know, it's both consumer and enterprise. What do you see as the next evolution of messaging? What do you think? Well, I actually think messaging is this really interesting foundational layer that in and of itself is not um, a product, but it's a feature around which great products can be built. Um, the way to think, the way that I think about this is like basically Facebook is proselytizing a set of behaviors and merchandising a set of capabilities to the internet writ large. Hmm. They're ahead of the curve, they are touching every user, and they're going to seed people with this monolithic app of Facebook, this Chrome that will allow you to share photos and message and you know post and get content and whatever. And I think what happens is that um, as more and more people get used to it, they go through a normal utilization curve where they first they start, they're not sure they like it, then they use it, then they get really addicted to it. And then probably what happens at some point in time, they start to wane. And um, in that entire process, I think that there is an opportunity for you to launch products that are basically taking point versions of that stuff and blowing it out and doing a much better job. So mm -hmm. Facebook can only do so much of a good job on photos, hence Instagram exists. Facebook can only do so well in messaging, hence WhatsApp exists. Um, 
And similarly, when you look at that, that's just in the consumer realm. But now, I think incrementally what's happening is people are saying, well, I'm used to these features. I use them all the time, four or five hours a day. Yeah. Uh, but what about in my work life or what about in other contexts? And so um, messaging in and of itself, in my opinion, is not a product. But it is a way to see a thread. It's a, it's a thread that allows you to build this next generation product experience where it is a foundational layer. So in many ways, Slack essentially said, let me build on top of this key capability that a billion and a half people understand, lightweight mobile messaging. Yeah but let me build it in the context of work and let me use it to allow you to collaborate and share information and optimize workflows, et cetera. Snapchat took the exact same premise and said, oh, Facebook's introduced chatting to a billion people, but let me create a safe place where now people can share content ephemerally and then consume content in, in this slightly different way and let me just own that mechanic. Yep. So that's the trail of breadcrumbs. So if I were you, what I would be thinking about is what are the sets of experiences that it's merchandising now to one and a half billion people a month? And where can you take that and apply it in a very specific context? Because the other thing is, we used to always believe that we lived in a zero-sum world. But now consumers will do that messaging experience across nine different apps, yep. right? They'll use Facebook, they'll use WhatsApp, they'll use Snapchat, they'll use Insta, they'll use Slack, and they'll use Remind as an example. Yeah. And so it's like, wow, now there's seven products that existed. Well, and if, you, if you watch my kids, like, they just, it's, it's, uh, it's effortless, right? I, I yeah. mean, we do some of that ourselves with, you know, like if I need to track you down, I can try you on Twitter, I can, I right, can text me. Yeah, what, you know, yeah. And, and, and to me, yeah. like I have to remember where, sometimes where I yeah, have Yeah, I used the, to run this messaging product at AOL called AIM and ICQ, and we used to talk about how it was zero sum, where if you were a user of AIM, you really weren't using Yahoo Messenger, MSN Messenger, and vice versa. Yeah. And now it's totally different. Yeah. The yeah. Venn diagram, the circles are overlapping yeah. and all of this stuff. Well, so it's not a product. So I think, a trying to answer the question of what comes, af comes after messaging, I think, is basically impossible. Hmm. It's a building block feature around which you should be figuring out where can I build like a uh, a niche graph, you know? Got it. Um, All right, Bill. Well, I, I hope that helps. Um, let's go to um, Michael in Half Moon Bay. Um, why did you decide not to focus on investing in social websites when you have so much experience in that area and might have an advantage? Interesting question. Yeah, so. I think I do have an advantage, and my um, realization is that um, there none of them are worth investing in. Um, and so I think I was reflecting my asymmetric knowledge there um, <laughs> by just avoiding the category. Oh, yeah. um, there's a really interesting dynamic that exists where when you have like a very large-scale outcome, like a Google or a Facebook, there tends to be this envelope of time three to four years after the fact where there's a lot of FOMO and a lot of like, you know, me tooism, where people are trying to chase the, the fumes of what's left over. Yeah. And so it's actually very difficult once you've come from a place like that or funded a place product like that to actually see how other products can work in that context but because they tend to be much smaller versions than that canonical version. Yeah. And so that's kind of why I avoided a lot of that stuff. It's interesting to watch, you know, the, the um, yammers, the war, like you guys. I mean, just to give an example, yeah. sorry not to interrupt you, just to give you an example, they're like, imagine if I was in that category. There's nothing there that's worth funding other than maybe Snapchat. But think of all the crap I would have funded on my way to try to find Snapchat, even if I did Snapchat. Yeah. And then it's like, was that worth it? Yeah. Probably yeah. not. So, so you guys funded Yammer, right? We did. So it's kind of like, version one of, of uh, Slack, right? I mean, uh, and, and I remember in my last company, we had like Jive going and Yammer and Slack didn't exist. Hip chat. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah. it was like, there were like six of them and, yeah. and, and the engineers were using IRC, so yeah. like they were, they were back in the, in the uh, dark ages, but uh, um, this stuff, stuff keeps moving. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Jake in La Jolla. Uh, what are the most important factors you look at in deciding to invest in a company? Um, you probably answered this before, but uh, maybe your thoughts have changed on it. So uh, whenever we uh, look at an investment now, we actually uh, will not move forward in deep diligence until we have a one-pager. And it can literally only be a page. And if you've ever tried to write a one-pager on something complex, it's really hard to capture saliently the, the few things that matter. And at the top, we always ask 
the same questions repeatedly. The first one is, is this really addressing a fundamental human need? And we've done a lot of work to try to actually unpack like what we think the, the fun, these fundamental psychological human needs in society are. And we try to say whether they meet them or not. And then we ask ourselves, you know, in 35 years, 30 years, in 2045, could this be used by a billion people? In 30 years, could this be a $100 billion plus company? And we say 30 years explicitly because it gives you the time horizon to see what could be possible. Yep. And, is there, and then the last question we ask is, is there somebody really special here? And um, when we're trying to get to ground truth, those are the questions that we're really trying to answer. And by answer, the best examples of investments we've made are ones where the answers are possibly, possibly, and probably. Interesting. See what I mean by the ambiguity? Absolutely. Um, but that's what we're looking for, to be able to roughly answer those questions with possibly. Many times the answers are no, no, and unlikely. Yeah. But it's possibly, possibly, probably is a fantastic set of answers for those questions. That's, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I think, um, as you said, trying to condense that down into a summary that makes sense. What, one page is actually shorter than I thought it would be. I know a lot of... Uh, we'll do decks and decks of diligence after the fact. Right. But all of that stuff, I kind of feel like my decision is largely made on that one pager. Um, and the principal has to write it, meaning I have to write it. Yeah. You know, and it's very hard. You can't delegate that responsibility. Yep. And uh, it really forces you to have clarity of thought. And it's fine that you're wrong. In fact, in, in being wrong, there's great learning moments where we can figure out what we didn't do right. Um, and so that's actually okay. The not learning part is unacceptable. And so it just allows us to kind of hone in on what we think we're trying to learn here. So, so in your firm, do people, you know come up to you and say, you know, you're wrong about that. Like, like you actively encourage that. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we like to have like an intellectual free-for-all. Yeah? Yeah. That's, and, um, that's awesome. Yeah, and in fact, like, you know, where, where, where we've made our mistakes is when we haven't really engendered the kind of debate that we need before we make a decision. And we become intellectually lazy or we don't write the one pager. Um, and so, you know, we have a bunch of kind of systems that we need to refine, frankly, but, you know, we keep iterating on them to be able to hit the pause button when those things aren't happening so that we can come back and reset. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is like, you know, this is like getting really good at anything. The, well, you and, know, it's and, just repeated muscle memory and refinement and just getting every, every single iteration just getting a little bit tighter and a little bit better. And, and it sounds um, to me like a startup, actually, because it is a startup. if you're not encouraging that debate and uh, dialogue, you know, j just because somebody's the QA engineer and maybe isn't the CTO doesn't mean they might not have an so opinion about it. So in our something. firm, if you asked anybody where they work, they'll say, oh, we work at a, whether they like where they work, they'll say, yeah, we work at this great company. Nobody says firm. Interesting. We're not a firm. Yeah. We're a company. Well, and if people have been to your office. Um, a company it, is a living, breathing organism. It it's trying like a, to constantly evolve. Yep. You know, we we live and work in a, in a space where any other startup company would work out of. Yep. And that's what we are. Yep. Um, that's great. All right, let's, um, let's keep moving here. We, uh, we have one from Paula in Menlo Park. I was very sad to hear that Better was shutting down. Can you share more about the VC process the team went through and what happened? And, and if you don't want to, I, I know that it's like no, still full, in progress. No, but, full, uh, full transparency. We're still trying to figure out a way to save it. but. You know, we started this thing. We brought in one of our partners, the Mayo Clinic, together. We started it with them. And we have this what is it? Talk about what, what Better is essentially like this medical concierge product. So the idea is that there's all this kind of complexity in healthcare, kind of akin to you see an iceberg, but you only see the, you know, the 10% that's above the waterline. But yeah. underneath is this gargantuan beast. Similarly, in healthcare, there's the 10% that you know how to deal with, but then there's 90% of its stuff, which is very complicated, whether it's you know, insurance reimbursements, billing errors, uh, prescription management. There's just a whole bunch of things within the healthcare infrastructure that are complex for people or create massive inefficiencies in their lives. Yep. You know, we had one person, I had one person, you know, tweet at me, which was about, you know, he has cystic fibrosis and it's just a real bear, his, his just procedural life just to keep himself in a good state of being. Yeah. And that better was like, you know, the salvation for him because he could outsource a lot of this functional task-oriented stuff to a medical concierge who could deal with that, who could deal with the prescriptions, deal with the doctors, you know, talk to the billing, you know, so all of that. So we launched that company, and we had some pretty good traction. 
Um, and we had a lot of demand from companies and healthcare providers to basically integrate that as part of what they were trying to do. And in the midst of that, you know, we needed to raise a Series B. And we had kind of put in 10-ish million bucks in to get it off the ground and really build it. And it's, it's a complex thing. And it was like crickets chirping. And, uh, you know, we couldn't get it raised. And so, so we kind of kept drip feeding it money, trying to figure out a way to get it raised. And we just couldn't do it. So ultimately, you know, what does it mean? I think healthcare, as I found out, I have a deep passion in. We've done a lot of it in. Um, all of our successes have been in companies where we've kind of taken, borne all the risk in the A and most of the B. Um, again, going back to sort of a lot of these VCs are waiting for product market fit in a way that, you know, they can just risklessly invest. Yep. Whereas my perspective is, well, fuck you. Like, you know, now that we have momentum, I'm just going to take all the money. I'm well, not going to share when things are working. Did they did they have product market you know? fit in this case? Or? Well, like, you know, the best example of this is Gluco. Like, Gluco had a lot of difficulty raising money. I started, I co-founded the company, and uh, it was it's in diabetes management. Yep. Again, you know, in my family, that's a very rampant disease. In South Asia, it's rampant. Here, it's rampant. So we thought we'd start a company to really address that, and we had a tremendous difficulty raising money. Hmm. In fact, I had to personally fund it because even the fund was getting tapped out, and they are now in escape velocity. And, you know, my whole perspective is great. I want to do every single dollar in that company now. Fuck everybody else. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't be afraid and then show up, you know, at the eleventh hour. That doesn't work for me. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to be there when the when the times are hard. Otherwise, you don't deserve to you don't deserve to get any credit. You don't deserve to be a part of that. You're just a leech. Yep. Um, so anyway, so back to better. Um, I think what we struggled with was um, we just didn't have the management team and the metrics to be able to raise, and uh, you know, there's no excuse for that. So that's that's honestly what happened. And I think uh, you know, had we made different sets of prioritizations or been able to build things slightly differently, maybe we'd had a different place. But, um, you know, we are where we are and we have to kind of figure out a way to salvage what we can and uh, maybe we can restart the company, you know, yeah. maybe we can't, but yeah. that's what happened. Well, and, and some great people over there, so uh, I, I hope uh, hope they have a soft landing or something. Well, the good uh, news is they're in, so they're in so much demand that if, you know, if we can't salvage what happens at Better, they'll all have. I, I feel very confident they'll all get to great places. Yeah, so. in minutes yeah, probably. Minutes. So, uh, all right, um, let's go to. Uh, here's one from Robert in Seattle. My startup is going well, and we've got seriously interested customers waiting for our product. Unfortunately, I had to let my CTO go, and part of the team may leave with him. What advice do you have in selecting a new CTO for my small company? I've actually lived through a situation like this, and. Um, uh, it's hard. So, what, what what do you think? What would you tell Robert if you were uh, on his board or working with him? This really comes back to cultural alignment. It has nothing to do with the capability of the role. Like when you when you're at a senior level, like the four or five people that are running a company, your functional competence, in my opinion, is largely irrelevant. Like you are a offshoot of the CEO. You are an appendage of that individual. And so whenever I see these issues, they're always because they're just culturally not aligned. Now, that's probably not entirely true. There's probably 5 or 10% of cases where you have someone who just fundamentally believes but just sucks. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think that's pretty rare. Yeah. In most of these cases, it's because that we did not spend enough time up front really hashing through these issues. I'm actually going through that process right now where, you know, we're in the midst of, you know, formulating a different product and, you know, uh, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how do I get to cultural alignment with the people I want to work with on this product? In your firm? Or yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And, and I've learned through experience that that is the hard process that you have to go through, and that can sometimes take weeks or months. And unless you do that, you're going to make a quick hire, a reactionary, reactive hire, and it's kind of a coin flip whether that's going to work out for you. Now, if it works out, hallelujah. But we probably shouldn't take away that we were a skillful recruiter from that. We should probably take away we probably got lucky. Yeah. Um, but what you really need to do is invest the weeks and the months. So that would be my advice to him is you have to date these people and just get really into their lives and let them get into your lives and really see if you guys are aligned so that when the chips are down or when you have philosophical disagreements, there's a framework of trust and respect in which to resolve it. I, th I think a lot of times what happens is uh, that alignment isn't there for a couple of reasons. One is um, just different life stage and where they're heading, how hard they want to work, like that whole bundle of issues. Um, I think that's a big one. I see that one a lot. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and then secondly, um, 
you know, I, I think sometimes uh, the, you know, their opinions about um, uh, not not so much where to take the company or the strategy, but um, but you know, it's it's more around um, how are we going to treat our employees and and what what sort of place are we going to have? What, what what's this going to be about? Are we mercenaries? Are we um, yeah. you know are not not so much kumbaya, but just sort of are we all in this together? What are we trying to do? And when I've when I've had issues with that, um, you know, it's it's usually because uh, somebody got hired who we didn't spend enough time vetting or talking to, like like even checking references. A lot of people don't check references on their VCs. They don't check them on yeah. like key hires like that. Um, uh, the other failure mode I see is when like two founders get together and they don't finalize their agreement of sort of like the founder prenup, I call it, where. Um, you know, well, how are we going to split the founder equity? Um, you know, what are we going to pay ourselves? Yeah. Are we going to take, you know, six weeks of vacation every, you know, like just sort of some fundamental issues and you find out pretty quickly, oh my God, like we're totally misaligned on yeah. this. So, um, uh, that's a hard one, but I think, I think great advice for Robert. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's keep going here. Um, here's one from Tony in San Francisco. How does a startup founder get your attention? Is it a cold email or a warm introduction or something else? Uh, I mean, I've declared email bankruptcy. <laughs> Again? Uh, yeah, so it's... Per a perpetual state of email bankruptcy? No, it tends to be like once a year I just capitulate and archive my entire inbox. Um, so I've hit that point. Okay. Um, well, so you got a, a fresh inbox for people yeah, so to now, attack. So now I have a fresh inbox and it's already like at like... I mean, unfortunately, I get like 300 emails kind of a day. I don't know if that's a large number or not, but it tends to be around that. That's a large and number. And so it builds up quickly, and I, I try to kind of prosecute it quickly. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, by the warm introduction makes it much easier because I have these filters set up so then if I have folks that I know, they pop up first. Uh, I've also told a lot of my friends, like, you know, you can just give people my phone number and they'll text me. And so uh, warm intro for me is the best. Um, just because uh, I just can't seem to find a structured way of getting through it all. I, uh, I, don't, know, I, mean, I don't know if I have a good answer, to I, be I don't with. think anybody has an yeah. answer for that. Whoever fixes that problem, although I, th I think that problem goes away. Like, my kids don't really use email, and uh, only when forced to, uh, as, as a, a young uh, senior in high school told me, who's not my, my child, said, um, uh, you know, only old people use email. So um, that well, this, soon that child will be old. So, uh, <laughs> so and, welcome. And and they'll be text messaging or Snapchatting or something. Yeah. Um, so uh, there you go, Tony. See if you can uh, hunt him down. Good luck with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, this one's from Tim in Boise. Uh, what are the mistakes you see startup CEOs making on a regular basis? Um, so, I, like I said, I think the two the two that I see the most is the difference between short-term greedy and long-term greedy. So if you're short-term greedy, you're going to be cheap with equity. I've never seen anybody build a successful company, you know, not giving away a lot of equity. Yep. Um, you are much better off owning a smaller piece of a massive thing, ask Mark Zuckerberg, than all of a small thing. And there are many examples of both that validate that this is true. So understanding and innately believing in this idea of being long-term greedy and giving away a lot of equity, I think, is the most important and leveraged thing that you can do. And what's great about that is that, you know, you give yourself a chance to be really right because if you get a really great hire right, the thing you're thinking is, wow, I'm so glad I gave this person this equity, they really deserve it. Yep. And that has massive implications on long-term retention of that person. And then the other thing is if they're not working out, it's actually not fatalistic because you generally have a one-year cliff. Yep. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing, which is a corollary to the first thing, is take the hiring seriously and really figure out whether these people are aligned and spend the amount of time to just do like backdoor reps and just like make sure that these people are great. Um, and it's incredible when you call somebody and say, listen, this is just a conversation between you and I, and I just need to get to ground truth on this, how open people are about the people they've worked with, irrespective of whether they're supposed to be an, you know, uh, an explicit reference that you've been given or a backdoor ref that isn't, that isn't expecting a phone call. Yeah. 
Uh, well, and, and sh it's shocking how transparent people want to be, which is why it's even more shocking when we don't take advantage of that and call people. Especially like founder to founder, there's there's an implicit, you know, Absolutely. yeah, we're in the cone of silence, and Absolutely. I'm going to tell you some things that I wouldn't say publicly, but Absolutely. let's go right. Yeah, and I, I've I've never had that trust betrayed in my entire career, so. Uh, um, I think that goes for, uh, you know, hiring employees as well as hiring investors, as I yeah. call it. So, uh, all right. Uh, well, Tim, hope that helps. Let's go to uh, this one's uh, from Twitter from Shane. Um, I'd be interested in hearing about any progress in the blood paneling startup Chamath invested in. So I don't know which one that is. I think he's talking about integrated plasmonics. And the unfortunate answer is that company went out of business. Oh, um, well, there you go. A lot of really complex science. We learned a lot there. Um, we were trying to create a lot of really, really hard stuff, and uh, uh, oh, oh, bless you. excuse me, uh, it's cold in here. Uh, it's, it's, you know, got to keep it. Uh, it's got to keep. Uh, actually, usually it's quite warm because of the lights, but, uh, uh, but no. But what I was going to say is that we tried our best uh, to do a lot of like three things at the same time, and I think our takeaway is, you know, startups can only really do one thing. Yeah. Um, so that was like a really interesting shot on goal. Now, what's interesting is we're in the midst of funding. Uh, a second version of that, bite at that apple. Uh, a slightly different approach, more generalized and um, less uh, scientifically complex. And really, this is just more an, an integration exercise. So, uh, and the first market will not be broad, bla broad based blood panels, but really specific protein detection, which we think is a more tractable starting point. Cool. So. Like, well, like most people, we're not giving up. We just keep <laughs> banging, banging our head against the wall. So, Shane, I, I don't know if that was the company, but uh, I hope, uh, hope that helps. Um, let's go. We've got time for a couple more here. Um, Jane Mountain View says, you're quoted as saying stasis in government is actually good for all of us, and yet also quoted as arguing for startup-specific taxes to provide low-income subsidized housing in San Francisco. Can you reconcile these two positions? Yeah, I don't think that those things are in conflict. I, I think San Francisco, if you're going to give a subsidy, and you're giving a subsidy to something that could be worth $200 billion, yep. it seems insane to not ask for something in return. Hmm. Are you referring I mean, venture, to a specific situation? No, I mean, no, I'm just saying in general. I mean, yeah. like, you know, venture investors pretend that they're going to give you all this help, and they give you a little money, and they get 20% of the company in return. I yeah. mean, you know, if, if the help doesn't really materialize, and all you really had was the money... Similarly, though, if like you know, if San Francisco creates special economic zones and is willing to give subsidized, you know, rent to startups, which I think is a wonderful thing, I don't think it's that crazy to say we want you to put in 50 basis points of your equity into this fund, or you know, 100 basis points of equity into this fund, and it'll allow us to build and take care of the not as well off if y your company works. Hmm. I think most founders would say, you know what, that's like pretty reasonable. Yeah. A thanks for helping me get in here cheaply, and B, yeah, I want to pay forward. Um, so the first comment, though, is really the um, extrapolation of this idea that I talked about before. You know, it, it, but I, I think that we're at an age where I think it's kind of naive to expect the government to act in most of these fundamental issues that really impact our society. So let's take something that's really provocative, like gun control. So last week, So last week we had this unfortunate, this terrible tragedy you know, this young guy. Again. Again, again, you know, nine people killed, nine people injured. Um, and we can debate gun control all day long. The reality is nothing's going to happen. That's the honest to God truth in legislation. But the practical solution that some of us could take is to actually try to create a system that solves mental health. You know, there's a lot of amazing benefits to cognitive behavioral therapy and other things that are like, you know, non-toxicological. And you can deliver that through your mobile phone or through, you know, immediate counseling over RTC, WebRTC. I mean, there's all these things that we can build. Yeah. So I think what I'm trying to say is that, like, we can go to some of these fundamental threshold issues where there's just so many people on both sides that it's just so unlikely that something will change. Or we can go to a different place that says, okay, let's just go to first principles and practically solve a problem. Let's MacGyver this thing, you know? Let's actually, like not wait for gun control legislation because we may be waiting for Godot. But and in the meantime, let's actually just go and build some substantive products in mental health and you know, maybe that, that's the boundary condition for a progressive government to be able to pass that legislation yeah. before they pass gun control. But couldn't, couldn't a group of individuals um, 
outfund the NRA in this situation, you know? Maybe, but I'm just saying, like, why are, like, I, I guess, you know, I don't know how much money the NRA has. I don't know how much money the people. $30 million went to Congress and, you know, I think you could people. build a great CBT app for, like, $2 million. Yeah. And still have $28 million left over. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying don't fight it, whatever issue you're on the side of. Let's take a different issue. Like, let's just take, you know, childhood obesity. You know, we could basically spend all of our time trying to legislate um, a better solution to, for example, food stamps. And we can say, you know what, let's replace food stamps with actual food. And let's find a way to, to productize low-cost, highly, you know, nutrient-complete food. And let's actually make that food stamp. So instead of it being stamps, let's make food food. Yeah. That's a, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a very conceptually beautiful idea largely intractable from a policy perspective. Yeah. And so, you know, what did we do? We invested in Sprig because our perspective was if we can get one of these food companies to scale, we can vertically integrate the food chain and be able to deliver low-cost food in the urban parts of Detroit subsidized by the $20 meals that, you know, potentially are being bought by people in San Francisco. And I think people, everybody would be fine with that. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's what I'm saying is like there are, there are these practical solutions that are calling out for people to support them. And I think we should just go and solve those things. And I don't think we should expect anything other than what's happening now to change. All the districting, all the gerrymandering has created such extremism in politics. I know, it's, crazy. it's not going to change in our lifetime. Yep. Well, listen, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, thanks for being such a great guest today. Really appreciate it. Um, if you want to follow uh, Chamath on Twitter, his Twitter handle remarkably is at Chamath, and I'll let you figure out how to uh, find that. And his uh, company's uh, Twitter handle just changed today, at Social Capital, so um, check them out as well. Uh, thank you once again to our amazing sponsors, Oric, Square One Bank, Creative Solutions, and Ustream. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. Um, you can also check out our website where you can see uh, the previous episodes and you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Uh, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones and we'll see you again next time.